On the third cassette tape of this Bible study lecture series, you will hear Dr. Howard C. E. Stepp, president of World Prophetic Ministry, continue teaching from the Old Testament book of Esther. Come now to the King is Coming Auditorium, Colton, California, and Dr. E. Stepp is teaching from Esther chapter 8, verse 7. Open your Bibles to the book of Esther. The Jewish Queen in Persia, chapter 8. And we're studying chapter 8, verses 7 through chapter 9, verse 16. I have a lesson outlined for you. For the rest of chapter 8, number 1, King Ahasuerus, number 1, King Ahasuerus reverses his decision to destroy the Jews. He reverses his decision. Verses 7 through 14. Number 2, Mordecai and the Jews exalted. Verses 15 through 17, which would conclude uh, chapter 8. Then we move into chapter 9. We have four parts there. One, fear of Mordecai and the Jews fall on their enemies. That's chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Two, their enemies slain. Verses 6 through 11. Three, Esther granted more privileges. Verse 12. And lastly, chaos among the Persians. Verses 13 through 16. As we've been studying this interesting book, we have seen the theme is God's providential care. We go now to chapter 8, beginning in verse 7 through 14. 1. King Ahasuerus reverses his decision to destroy the Jews. And we look at verse 7. It says, Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Esther the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman. What's this all about? Uh, Haman been hung on a tree. He's in trouble not desiring to see the queen and her people in such danger and fear, Ahasuerus turned the house of Haman over to her and to Mordecai to do as they pleased with it. And they were permitted to write letters to all the Jews in the king's name and seal with his ring, saying that they should come together in every city throughout the kingdom to destroy all who would seek to destroy them. Haman, who gave a plot to destroy the Jews. It has been reversed. Haman has been hung on the gallows that he erected to be the means of executing Mordecai. And now the king is reversing his decision, reversing his whole decision. Because it says in the middle of verse 7, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows because he laid his hand upon the Jews. It was a very intriguing situation. It looked like all the Jews in the Persian Empire were going to be killed, genocide, slain, executed, because Haman, evidently a very wealthy man, had promised large sums of silver to the king's treasury if uh, the Jews were annihilated. Verse 8 says, Write ye also for the Jews as it liketh you. Notice that little phrase, as it liketh you. The king is so exuberant and so carried away in reversing his decision because he had previously issued a decision to slay all the Jews. Now he's changed his mind. He said to Esther and to Mordecai, Notice that, as it liketh you. You decide what you want done to your enemy. It's rather interesting, isn't it? As it liketh you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring, for the writing which is written in the king's name, and seal with the king's ring, may no man reverse. In other words, whatever you say, this will be final. There will be no reversing of your instructions, it'll be complete. It'll be final. Under the laws of the Medes and the Persians, the king says this is final, it's final. Nobody's going to reverse it. Verse 9. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month. 
the decree to destroy the Jews had been made on the 13th day of the first month, which was April. Now the decree to cancel it by authorizing the Jews to defend themselves was made on the 23rd day of the third month, which was June, according to the letter sent to the king's officers and the Jews of all of the 127 provinces of the Persian Empire. Then were the king's scribes called at that time in the third month, that is, the month of Sivan, on the three and twentieth day thereof, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews and to the lieutenants and the deputies and the rulers of the provinces which are from India unto Ethiopia. A hundred and twenty-seven provinces unto every province according to the writing thereof, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writings, and according to their language. The king is making sure that this order, which has come from Esther the queen and Mordecai, that is everybody in the kingdom is going to know about. So he has it written in every language, so that everybody will know about it. And then what's going to happen? Verse 10. And he wrote in the king a Hazurus name and sealed it with the king's ring and sent letters by post on horseback. These are messengers and riders on mules, camels, and young dromedaries. It's rather interesting. Originally, when Haman sent out the order to execute all of the Jews, they sent them out on foot. The messengers went throughout the whole kingdom by foot. But now you'll notice they're sending them as tried animals because they want the orders delivered as quickly as possible throughout the whole kingdom of Persia. So they're, being, they're to travel on horseback, mules, camels, Young dromedaries, verse 11, wherein the king granted the Jews, which were in every city, to gather themselves together and to stand for their life, to destroy, to slay, and to cause to perish all the power of the people in province that would assault them, both little ones and women, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. So the king now has granted permission for Esther, Mordecai, and all the Jews to reverse the execution order and to slay everybody who was of the mind to slay the Jews. It's hard to think that human beings would be so cruel with each other, isn't it? But if you go back and you trace the history of the Jewish people, you'll find that they've always been in trouble, always been persecuted, always been threatened. They've always lived under the shadows of war, except in the days of David and Solomon, when God gave them peace, 40 years of peace, under each monarch. But generally speaking, the Jews have lived in times of persecution. And we see it right here in the kingdom of Persia in the 5th century A.D. Verse 12 says, Upon one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely, upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar, the copy of the writing for a commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people, and that the Jews would be ready against that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. So the post that rode upon mules and camels went out. Haman's messengers, as I said, were runners. They walked or ran. But in this situation, they're going to ride animals because they're desirous that this law or this announcement or this ruling in every language of the 127 provinces reach the people as soon as possible because they have set the date when all of these enemies are going to be slain. 
It's rather interesting that God has brought all of this about. God has allowed the, the animosity and the hatred and the sin and the vengeance to rise up in the heart of Haman and his followers. Now, they, Haman has been done away with. Now, God is going to punish those who were going to be instrumental in doing away with the Jews. It goes back to a verse of scripture that we've quoted many times, and it says, He that liveth by the sword shall die by the sword. And that's pretty well a universal law. You just follow that on the world scene, and when there's a coup in one of the South American countries, or over in the Middle East, or some of those countries where they're always changing governments every five, ten years, if they come in shooting, they go out shooting. Live by the sword, you die by the sword. Rather interesting, but vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will avenge. Not us. Not we. God will avenge. So he's going to get vengeance upon them. So the decree, according to verse 14, so the posts that rode upon mules and camels went out being hasted and pressed on by the king's commandment, and the decree was given at Shushan the palace. So the order went out. They're going to slay everybody that had anything to do with this. King Ahaz Ures reverses his decision to destroy the Jews. We move to the second and the concluding part of this particular chapter. Mordecai and the Jews exalted. You remember Mordecai was always sitting in the king's gate, dressed in sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth was just a common type of cloth that the poorest of the people made garments out of, or they draped their bodies in that kind of cloth. Very coarse, inexpensive, available to the poorest of the people. And we always saw Mordecai sitting in the king's gate dressed in sackcloth and in ashes. Now he's going to be exalted. It's rather interesting. I made myself a little note here to turn over to Matthew chapter 23. Look at verse uh, 12. Just in comparison, listen and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased or put down or dethroned or taken off of your seat of exaltation. The latter part of that verse, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Mordecai humbled himself. Haman didn't. Haman exalted himself. He played himself up to the king. And he was humbled. He was executed. He was hung in a public square so the throng could see him hanging from a gallows by his neck stretched with a broken neck. Poor old Mordecai, God's man, that in the gate of the king, where the dignitaries of the government came in and out there, sat Mordecai, sackcloth and ashes, so something's going to happen. We begin now in verse 15 through 17. And Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white. He changed clothes. I'm assuming he took a bath. went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white and with a great crown of gold and with a garment of fine linen and purple, the best cloth that could money could buy. He has changed garments from sackcloth to fine linen and purple. He humbled himself. God's allowing him to be exalted. You see, God sets up kings and God dethrones kings. All government in this world is under the control of God. 
Now, I didn't say that God uh, authorizes all of the different governments. I didn't say that. I said all governments are under the control of God. There isn't a government existing upon the face of the earth at this hour that God can't topple if it's according to his will. But God permits. And so now he is going to permit Mordecai to be exalted. And he allows him to put on this apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold, with a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was happy. The Bible says that God can cause even your enemies to be at peace with you. And this population of the Persian Empire, especially in the area of the palace of Shushan, were very much against the Jews because the decree had gone out. Let's kill them, let's get rid of them. And evidently the population of the people were in harmony with that and they were ready to carry out the orders of execution. But now the whole thing has been reversed. And the people are glad that Mordecai is in a place of prominence, dressed in this royal apparel. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. Verse 16, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. God will exalt in due time. The thing that we have to consider in our own personal lives is not to get over anxious. If we get over anxious and we wonder how come I'm not getting to the top of the ladder so fast. Maybe God knows at the top of the ladder you wouldn't be the successful Christian for him. You are halfway down the ladder. Or maybe at the bottom of the ladder. God knows. You see, God has all of this under consideration. But when the time came to put Mordecai at the top of the ladder, he put him up there because the whole city rejoiced. And verse 16 says, The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor, and in every province, 127 of them, according to verse 17, and in every city, Whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. All the Jews were happy. And we speculated in one of our previous lessons that there must have been probably upwards of at least a 100,000, maybe more, but at least a 100,000 Jews living in the Persian Empire. Because 70 years previous to this, about 85 years to be exact, Nebuchadnezzar had gone up to Jerusalem and he had taken certain Jews captive and shipped them off to Babylon. 70 years later, Cyrus of Persia gave a decree for 50,000 of them to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city, restore the walls, hang the gates. And under Zerubbabel, a Jew, rebuild the temple. That was only 50,000 that went back. Many of them in that 70 years of captivity had gone into business. Well, you couldn't keep a Jew from going into business. You'd have to have some kind of a store, something, pawn shop of some kind. You have to have some kind of a business. So those who had gone into business in the Persian Empire, they stayed behind. They didn't go back. And Cyrus of Persia told them to go back. So there was a large contingent of Jewish population living in the Persian Empire. And so when the word came out after Esther had persuaded the king to reverse his decision, you could see the happiness in the hearts of the Jews. All over the kingdom, they're shouting and singing in the streets, much like they do in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and Haifa today. When they have a holiday, they go, they block off the streets, and the musicians come out into the main thoroughfare of the cities, and they dance and they sing and they carry on till way after midnight. Happy, it's part of their way of life. 
So they're doing the same thing here in Persia. They're all excited. The middle of verse 17. The Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day, and many of the people of the land became Jews. Those who had been enemies are those who had been on the fence, didn't know which way to go, are those who hadn't been on the fence and up to that time they uh, hadn't been persuaded that the Jews were God's people, but evidently they must have had some kind of a reconciling of this matter to their own hearts because many of them were converted to Judaism because it says, and many of the people of the land became Jews. For the fear of the Jews fell upon them. They wanted to protect their own skin. They didn't want to be slaughtered in case the Jews would uh, execute them. And they didn't know how many were going to execute, be executed. They didn't know how far the extreme they would go to carry out this commandment. If Gentiles could become Jews, certainly... The term cannot be limited to those from the tribe of Judah only, as some teach and believe today. There are those who teach today that uh, the ten northern tribes were not involved in this. Those are the people who are known as the British Israelites. They are the people who teach that America and Great Britain, the British Commonwealth, are the ten lost tribes of Israel. So they teach that the ten northern tribes, which in, went into Assyrian captivity along about 720 some B.C., were not involved in this, but they were. A remnant of the ten northern tribes were involved in this. It's only after the Babylonian captivity that the twelve tribes are known or spoken of or identified as Jews. We have them identified here as Jews. Many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. So Mordecai and the Jews are exalted. Now we move into chapter 9, and the first part of our lesson here is verses 1 through 5. And the fear of Mordecai and the Jews fell on the enemies, or on the enemies of the Jews. We begin in chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twelfth month, that is, the month Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, and now there's a parenthesis, though it was turned to the contrary that the Jews had ruled over them that hated them, close the parenthesis, verse 2, the Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus, to lay hand on such as sought their hurt. At a given time, at a decreed time, on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, when the first decree was to be executed, and on the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, they gathered together in all the cities of the 127 provinces of the empire to defend themselves and destroy all who sought to Kill them. It's going to be a bloody revolution. You think the Khomeini revolution in Iran has been bad, but this was even worse. If you're going to see even more blood flowing from the revolution in the days of Esther and Mordecai. Look at verse 3. And all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and the officers of the king helped the Jews. These are governmental officials, officials. All of them helped the Jews. Basically, they were scared for their lives. Number two, they were officers in the kingdom. They needed a way of making a livelihood. They had to have a wage. They had family. So, uh, of the two evils, you choose the lesser. So they chose the lesser. They chose to help the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them according to verse 3. Notice what it says in verse 4. For Mordecai was great in the king's house. 
Mordecai became great in the king's house, so that his fame went throughout all countries, and the Jews gained the victory over all their enemies. Rather interesting, isn't it? If you are humble, and you don't seek to exalt yourself in due time, God will exalt you. Mordecai, humble, in due time, God exalted him. We have a perfect example of this of Joseph down in Egypt. His brothers sold him off down into Egypt, you know, to get rid of him. And he went down there, he had unusual gifts of some God upon him, and he turns out to be the prime minister of Egypt. God exalted him. And his very brothers who sold him into Egyptian bondage, they were the ones who came begging to buy corn. Because God permitted a drought up in Canaan. And they hightailed it off down to Egypt to buy corn. And who's standing at the granary door to sell them the corn? Their brother, whom they had sold in the bondage or slavery, whom they had told their father that a wild animal had killed him. You see how God works? God's smart. God's been in this business for quite a while. He dealt with all kinds of different people. There's n nobody pulls any wool over on the eyes of God. Nobody comes up with God with a new scheme that hasn't been uh, rehashed or rehearsed before. I think if Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun, at least not with God. No sirree. Mordecai was great throughout the whole kingdom. 127 provinces, from India to Ethiopia. Sometime when you're looking in the back of your Bible or the map, there's a look. From India all the way to Ethiopia, 127 provinces. Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went out throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. God was with him. The king had been convinced that this man was unique. This man had some quality that the other men in his kingdom had never demonstrated before. Evidently, King Ahasuerus gave him more liberty, gave him greater responsibilities. Mordecai becomes actually more powerful than the king in a real sense of the word as far as the people uh, paying homage to him and being interested in him. Verse 5 says, Thus the Jews smote all their enemies with the stroke of the sword and slaughter and destruction and did what they would unto those that had hated them. People dying all over the Persian Empire. They searched them out. The Jews are very clever at that. They're very clever. They can, they do spy work, you know, and blow up buildings, blow up bridges, blow up, they, they have a uniqueness about them that Gentiles don't possess. And so they searched out all of these people who had said anything against them, who had plotted against them, who had connived against them, who had entered into an arrangement with other people to be an instrument in the slaying of them. And then when the thing was reversed, they went in and slew them all. <coughs> Fear of Mordecai and the Jews fall on their enemies, verses 1 through 5. Now we look at the enemies slain in verses 6 through 11, and we see the magnitude of this slaughter, the reversal of King Ahasuerus' orders. We see the magnitude of it, beginning in verse 6 through 11. Verse 6 says, and in Shushan, the palace, the Jews slew and destroyed 500 men. Now, you wouldn't think that in the capital city at Shushan there would be that many enemies. But they slew 500. 
they found 500 people in the area of Shuchan the palace who were instrumental or who were backing up Haman and his plot to do away with the Jews. So now the tables have turned. So 500 are destroyed according to verse 6. Verse 7, And Parshandetha and Dalphon and Astetha, verse 8, and Portha and Adelea and Aridatha, verse 9, and Parmasa and Arisia and Aradea and the Jezepha, 10, the sons of Haman, the sons of Hamdeatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they. What did they do? They found the ten sons of Haman. What's God going to do? He's going to stop Haman's posterity. Why? He's a wicked man. Verse 10 says they found the ten sons of Haman. The son of Ham, the Ephah, the enemy of the Jews, slew they, but on the spoil laid they not their hand. They didn't take any of the spoil of the war. They didn't uh, go into the houses after they had slain the people of the house and robbed them of their silver and their gold, their furniture, their musical instruments, their clothes, whatever they had. They didn't touch a thing. They were just bringing revenge upon them. Revenge belongs to the Lord. That's why I inject this little thought. If somebody has wronged you, forget about it. Just be nice to them. God will get even with them. I saw a little sign the other day. I've mentioned it before. It says, love your enemies and drive them nuts. Someone boasts, you know, I'm going to get even with you. Dismiss it. God will get even with them. They won't get even with you. God will get even with them. Absolutely. So we have the ten sons of Haman slain, but on the spoil laid they not their hand. Verse 11, On that day the number of those that were slain in Shushan the palace was brought before the king. So they told the king, he has yours. After the revolution was over and after the uh, fighting had died down and the thing had been quelled and subsided and the dead were carried away or carted away to be buried, they counted the bodies and they made a report to the king. What's going to happen? Verse 12 is rather startling. Rather interesting, verse 12. And the king said unto Esther the queen, the Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan the palace. You see, the king reported to Esther the number of men slain. The Jews had killed 500 in the ten sons of Haman, who wondered what they had done in all the other cities of the empire. The king didn't realize that his kingdom was in the state of being taken over by Haman. If you look through this plot, a little more carefully, Haman was not only trying to get rid of Mordecai, but he was really trying to get rid of the king. And then he would have been advanced to the position of the monarch of the kingdom. But God didn't want him to be the monarch of the kingdom. God dealt with it. Verse 12, Esther granted further petitions of the king, and the king said unto Esther the queen, the Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan the palace, and the ten sons of Haman, what have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Let's get a report from all of the other provinces. Let's find out what has happened throughout the whole kingdom. Middle of verse 12, Now what is thy petition? He's saying to the queen, Now what else do you want? And it shall be granted thee, for what is thy request further, and it shall be done. Evidently, the king has confidence in Mordecai and Queen Esther. And so he's willing now, when he realizes he had all of these enemies 
if they're in the palace area, that we're plotting actually, in a sense, against him. Because if they would plot behind his back, working through Haman to destroy the Jews, they would reverse their sinister activities to plot against the king and destroy him. You see, people who are of that nature, and they're trying to destroy someone, they don't care who they destroy as long as they destroy them. And so they can change the target momentarily. And the king must have realized this. Now he's saying to Esther in so many words, <laughs> whatever you want, honey, you just name it. You've got it. There's a song, whatever Lola wants, Lola gets. Well, whatever Esther wants, Esther gets. And that's what verse 12 is telling us. We move into verses 13 through 16, and we see chaos among the Persians, beginning with verse 13. There it says, Then said Esther, If it please the king, still having that persuasive way about her. And she doesn't tell the king exactly what she wants. She kind of comes up to him in a nice way, looks up into his eyes, and says, if it pleased the king, that she knows that she's turned on the child, he's willing to ride a motorcycle backwards if it would please her. But she didn't have motorcycles in those days. Then said Esther, If it pleased the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow also according unto this day's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. She had a little resentment in her heart for the dirty way in which he had treated her uncle, Mordecai. Haman had almost spat upon him as he walked in the gate, wanting Mordecai to get up and pay homage to him and all of that kind of business. And she had that little bit of resentment down in her heart. And she said, uh, could we have the ten sons of uh, Haman? hung on the gallows? Would that be asking too much? That be? Whew, what a place to live. You never know if your neck's going to be stretched the next day or not. Yeah. And let Haman's ten sons so forth, verse 14, and the king commanded it so to be done. And the decree was given at Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. No lineage of Haman. Son killed. Died. Horrible death. Vengeance wrought upon them by God Almighty. What a family tree that is to leave behind. Verse 15. For the Jews that were in Shushan gathered themselves together on the fourteenth day also of the month of the month Adar, and slew three hundred men of Shusha. This is another three hundred. We got five hundred previous to this. But on the prey they laid not their hand. Never took a ring, piece of jewelry, nothing. No pieces of art, no stone, nothing. Never touched any of the belongings. They were only being used of God to bring vengeance upon those who had wrought havoc upon the Jews. The whole thing of this lesson is to show you God's providential care. When God gets ready to bring vengeance upon the enemy, God can do it. God doesn't need any help proving that when Jesus Christ returns to the earth at the battle of Armageddon, he's not going to need the forces of the NATO or the Common Market or the North Atlantic Treaty, as NATO represents the United States or Russia or anybody. And God sends his son back to this earth to bring vengeance upon the unbelieving world who will populate planet earth at that time, it will be God pouring out his vengeance upon an unsuspecting world. Rather interesting. 
turn over to the book of Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, right about what we're talking about. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction or punishment from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe in that day. God doesn't need anybody's help. God doesn't need the atomic bomb, the various bombs that we have, the various missiles. He doesn't need any of that. He just sends the Lord Jesus Christ down to the earth, and Jesus Christ brings vengeance upon an unbelieving world. This verse 16, same thing. Chapter 9 of the book of Esther. And the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies. God makes even your enemies to be at peace with you when we are in the will of God and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies and slew of their foes 70 and 5,000. 75,000. But they laid not their hands on the prey. Never took a gold ring, a earring, a piece of fur, piece of leather, piece of furniture, never took a stick of anything, not a piece of anybody's property. He just slew them. Seventy-five thousand. The Khomeini revolution is nothing compared to what went on in the days of Esther. You can see why the Feast of Purim, P-U-R-I-M, means so much to the Jewish people. When that two-day holiday comes around every year, they read afresh the book of Esther to their children. Like we read the part in the Gospels about the birth of Christ, at Christmas time. More so than any other time of the year, we read the, the account of the birth of the Christ child. For the Jews of Purim, they read the book of Esther. Because they want their children to remember, to tell their children, to tell their children, to tell their children that God delivered them at the hands of a wicked king and a subtle man who was intriguing the king to slaughter all the Jews in the Persian Empire, but God delivered them. And they want their children to know this. And on the basis of that, I contend there is a little spark of hope in the heart of every Jew who will listen to the reading of the book of Esther, especially at the time of Purim, because if he will read Esther and listen to the method in which God delivered his people, then there's hope that someday the Holy Spirit might break through that hard granite wall of unconcern about the hearts of most Jews today. Book of Esther, the theme, God's providential care, God's providential deliverance. What I'm getting out of the book of Esther is giving me courage to be faithful to God, to trust God, to believe God, to rely upon God, to wholly commit my ways unto God, that God might take what little talents I have and use them for his honor and glory. And these things which we have accumulated around us to work with, the property, the buildings, the machines, the electronic equipment, use it. Tell unbelieving people all over the world that Jesus Christ's second coming is drawing nigh. 
You have heard Dr. Estep deliver the fifth message in a series of Bible studies from the book of Esther, chapter 8, verse 7, through chapter 9, verse 16. This series of Bible study lectures continues on the other side of the cassette.